And everyone, thanks so much for coming to learn about NFTs today. Um, Blake, why don't we start off with you? Um, how do you make an NFT? Yeah. Um, what's up, guys? My name is Blake. I'm an NFT artist based in Brooklyn. Well, actually, I'm just an artist based in Brooklyn. Ooh. NFTs is one of the things. Did I get a boo? Or I get a woo? Is that a woo or a boo? It was a woo. Woo, woo Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, so I have a, a gallery there called Minty Garden. And we do a mix of physical art and uh, digital art, NFT stuff, both with my art as well as like there's a thriving community of NFT artists in, in New York. So just a little bit of context uh, for you guys before I dive into how to make an NFT. I've been in the space for uh, about a year and a half, pretty relatively early on Super Rare, and I look at myself in that in this space as kind of like a crash test dummy. I've tried a ton of different every single platform that I was able to try uh, for different projects basically dipping into the archive of, of my old art. So we get into making an NFT, and NFT could be almost anything, but if we're just thinking about like visual arts, it's gonna be like a image or, or a video. And... Actually, before we go into how to make an NFT, let's okay. just do the intros. Oh, that's a good idea. Good yeah, let's yeah. do that. Uh, thanks, Sarah, my name's Andy Lee. Uh, I'm an attorney based in New York uh, at the firm of Foley and Lardner. And I've been doing a lot of work in this space, especially over the last year. My background is in technology, media, entertainment, and sports. Uh, I'm also creative by nature, play guitar, I have a family of creators, and we're very you know, interested in this space. I've just been seeing a lot of exciting activity and happy to talk about the legal issues that come along with creating and putting one of these projects out there. Okay, great. And then just a quick background on me. So yes, I write about NFTs for Entrepreneur Magazine, and I've been covering the space pretty extensively. I also write for Coin Market Cap and Coin Telegraph. But what I did is I started a company. It's called Cubelo, and my co-founders here. You happen to meet Apollo, and we're building an incubator for NFT uh, entrepreneurs who might not have experience uh, with monetary policy launching tokens, and uh, developing smart contracts. So with that being said, let's jump into how to create an NFT for yeah. an artist himself. Yeah, so uh, like I said, if, if we're just thinking about visual arts, NFTs can be a lot of different things, but let's just stick to visual. Uh, we've got either like an image, and for me, because I make physical paintings, that means I make a painting, I take a photograph of it, uh, do a little bit of Photoshop just to kind of make it look as well as I want to on a computer screen. And then, like I said, I've been a crash test dummy. So there's like so many different platforms, uh, and even at this point, different blockchains. I've primarily focused on Ethereum, and I've done the most amount of projects on OpenSea. And so if you're just starting out, you, there's a couple things that you have to set up, and I think that that friction is part of the reason that NFTs aren't more mainstream, and as that gets easier and easier, NFTs will become more and more prevalent across like the masses in terms of participation. I think a lot of people are aware of it, but it's hard to participate. And so if I'm signing up a new artist, I'm having them set up for Coinbase so that they can buy some Ethereum with US dollars. I have them set up MetaMask, which is a Google Chrome extension. Uh, I remind them over and over again to not lose or share the seed phrase because that's like scary that if you get, like I've got locked out of my online banking a dozen times. And if, I, if you get locked out of MetaMask, you're, you lose everything, there's no helpline. So get set up for MetaMask, and then go to OpenSea, and you're gonna log in with your MetaMask, and as a creator, uh, or as anyone, you just hit create up at the top. Um, and then it's, it's a pretty straightforward uh, form that you're looking at, where you're dropping in the media, which is, in my case, usually a still image, title, description, uh, you know, and any other properties that I wanna communicate along with that art, and click Mint, and then basically it's up to uh, me to kind of promote it and go find someone that that could buy it. And in terms of selling the NFTs on OpenSea and other platforms, uh, you can set a fixed price, you can set an auction, or you can just have it basically with no price listed, but you're just accepting offers. What about generative, what about generative art? Yeah, so generative art is, are much larger uh, scale projects than like a single individual NFT. And uh, I have one generative project called Knights of Degen, and essentially it's it's, it's a lot of the characters I think that people think of when they think of the NFT space, whether it's the punks, the bored apes, uh, cool cats, you know, there's, there's so many different um, projects. And those are 
definitely much more complicated than like clicking on the create button and filling out the info. Um, I mean, that's like a whole conversation itself, but you're basically running an algorithm to take like traits of an art and layer them, and then those are getting minted on the back end, either to OpenSea or somewhere else. I, I mean, the project I did there, I didn't do any of the minting, I just made the art, and then we have an engineer that, that did both like the smart contract as well as the, the kind of algorithm that builds the final NFTs that people see. For people out there who haven't seen generative art NFT projects, um, the artist will draw all of the attributes and then the computer program puts it together through the smart contract. So when you click mint, it's coming together for the first time. It's not like it was already there. So the artist wouldn't even know what it's going to look like before it's minted. So the person who is minting it is actually part of that process of creating the NFT. Yeah, and so like for the generative project that I did with Knights of Degen, I think I designed somewhere in the range of like 200 different attributes that would be stacked in different ways. And that came up with like, there's like 66 million combinations that are possible. And then we minted 8,000 of them, 8,888. And so like there's still, there's millions of, of combinations of that art that will never exist. Uh, but that's kind of the fun part is because you're like rolling the dice. You don't know what you're gonna get. I and like smart, that. yeah, it is. You don't know what you're going to get. And sometimes you get a rare one uh, with a rare, higher rarity attribute, which is part of the smart contract process of the developer. Um, but there's a big difference between smart contracts and real contracts. And often the artists have to actually have a, a physical paper contract signed before they engage on these kinds of projects. Um, you can't just rely on standard contracts. Most of them are custom. Uh, per the artist and their preferences. So um, what are we seeing in terms of, you know, first of all, the comfort level of an artist and then when the lawyers come in, um, helping those artists get what they deserve, uh, that could be on secondary sales, um, but also protecting the artists to make sure that their copyright is what they intended their art to be as the artist, as the visionary for that project. Um, any thoughts there? Sure, yeah, there's um, obviously NFTs, we've been talking about them, thinking about them, you've heard of the phrase, the, the concept of a smart contract, which is basically the, the code that is the NFT. It's, it's maybe not the best phrase for, for what it is, but it really is the NFT, and then it's, 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 it's a computer program that's being deployed on the blockchain to execute certain things. In the, in the simplest phrase, it's displaying the art that you've created as part of the NFT, and most of them also include a uh, function for secondary sale royalties, resale royalties, so that someone buys your art, obviously when they resell it, you're going to get, assuming that you created the NFT with, the most common is a 10% royalty, every time it's sold, 10% of the sale will go directly into your wallet that is executed automatically by the smart contract without any further human intervention. No one needs to go and, you know, transfer the money from, you know, the, the seller's account to back to the artist. It happens automatically. There's a difference between that and a legal contract or a smart legal contract, which might be kind of some combination of both of them. So uh, everyone here, I'm sure, knows you can enter into a contract electronically by any sort of, you know, means that acknowledges a set of terms or conditions. So that kind of thing can be incorporated into the metadata of the NFT, which becomes part of the smart contract. And I think like just to make it tangible for people of what that means, and like in my experience, is I'm you if I'm using a smart contract, I might have a clause in there, clause might not be the right word. I might have a line of in there that says, okay, when a when a primary sale happens, the revenue is going to be split in this way. It's going to go X to Blake, Y to Mike you know, so on, for, so on and so forth. And those are the type of things that I would put into my legal contracts when I do other projects to say, hey, when, when this art sells, if we're collaborating on something, this is how the splits are gonna work. Right, right, and a lot of artists like you are, you know, not just going directly to OpenSea, but they might be, uh, especially young artists, there are, there are a lot of really exciting platforms and new companies out there that are searching for artists to help them, bring them, you know, bring them to market. Um, right. To, to, and, and there's a lot of charitable aspects to that, and there, there's companies um, like, like Jordan's company, VCNFT, working with different artists uh, to help them bring NFTs to market. So they have a deal, 
right? Because both parties are contributing to that. It's not just the artist putting something up on OpenSea, but the company, the platform, is building the platform, they're marketing the platform, they're doing everything, and then there's a financial deal. All of that needs to be documented between those parties. And you also have to be sure when you do a sale to a, a purchaser of the NFT, if there are gonna be limitations, things that they can do or can't do, it's not enough that there might be something buried in your smart contract someplace because as a, as a matter of law, if they don't know about it, right, those smart contracts are a bunch of you know, ones and zeros. You can convert them if you know what you're, what, how to decode it, you can decompile it and have it audited and all of that, but the, the normal consumer is not gonna be aware of any of that. So you gotta put stuff in your description if there's any limitations you wanna put or binding terms or that becomes difficult for artists, right? Because you don't necessarily want to complicate your NFT page with a bunch of, of legal jargon. So, uh, you know, it could be a, you could you could in, uh, include a link to an IPFS PDF document that has all the terms and conditions. But it's really important that to be able to point back to the transaction, which is evidenced on the blockchain, right? Which is great. The kit, you know, it happened, and as long as you can show the information was there then it can be binding as a legal matter on yeah. the purchaser. So, I, so if, let's just say I don't do that. I don't put the, put, I think that's a great idea, but obviously I've done a bunch of NFTs and I didn't do that on any of them. Uh, what's like the, if, if I don't have anything in the description that kind of delineates like what you can and can't do with this NFT that I just sold you, what would be like the assumed? The default. Yes. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. So from a copyright perspective, Right? The, the default is, it's still a good idea to let people know this, right? Because most people don't necessarily understand this. But the, so there's the, the actual piece of art. Think about it, a physical art. Someone sells a, you know, the painting on the wall up there. Um, the purchaser owns that painting. They can resell that painting if they want. Subject to things called moral rights. You know, they can do whatever they want with it. But the copyright of that painting still belongs to the artist. Okay, so if it wants, if they want to license it to be put on, so they can't print it on a T-shirt. They can't print it on a T-shirt. The artist controls that. Okay, right. let's translate that to the NFT world. Um, you know, the whole concept of an NFT is it's so easy to copy and redistribute, and obviously people are going to put it on their on their profile picture, right, and and text screenshots of it to people, whatever it is. All that happens, and but technically, unless there's a written assignment or license or something making it what's called a work for hire, which is not gonna apply in this context, the artist owns the copyright and controls the copyright. Um, I happen to think it's a good idea to for artists to let their purchasers know about that and to be clear about that, because otherwise it's hard to unring a bell. You know, if, if someone goes out and they license it or they, they put it on t-shirts or they put it up, you know, they start uh, advertising for their company, it becomes their company logo or something like that, right? You, you're going to have to sue them, you're going to have to spend money on lawyers, there's all kinds of things you're going to have to go through, and you can avoid that if you're clear up front. And but if you are clear up front, that doesn't stop them from doing it, and then you would still have to go sue them. Uh, yes, you, you would, you would, but you're going to have an easier time yeah. with it. It's, it's, a, better it's case. a proof issue. And you're also going to reduce possibility of that, because right. there's a... There's a there's it won't like, always be intentional. Well, it's, it's right? part, part of it is educational, right? People might rightly assume, well, I bought this NFT, I can do whatever I want with it, right? It's, it's, not, it's not unreasonable to think they might assume that. You're sitting here, you're an artist, this is your own property, and you didn't know the answer. Right. Right? So people out there who are buying it, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an arcane legal concept. And that's one of the issues that is very interesting with NFTs. Like it's moving, the concept, the technology is moving so fast but it has to square up with legal principles that are a couple hundred years old. Or even with contracts that are maybe 10, 10 or 15 years old. There's a, I mean, everyone probably heard about Quentin Tarantino. He's selling in the, the Pulp Fiction NFTs and Miramax is suing him. Okay, great. It goes back to a contract assignment when Miramax bought the rights from him in 2004, sometime in the 2000s, whatever it was. And it's based on the language of this contract. And there's a big argument over them, over to what a particular phrase means and how it applies to this type of use. That phrase, work for hire? That phrase was not work for hire. The phrase was, um, Quentin has certain reserved rights that he could do, right? He, has, he reserved the right to uh, a screenplay, screenplay publication. 
His NFTs include images of the screenplay. Some of it are his original, his original notes. And one of the, there are various things at play here, but one of the questions is, um, does taking the screenplay and digitizing it and putting it in an NFT, does that constitute screenplay publication in the sense that the parties intended at the time? Right, because the question of, of contract obligations is based on what the party's intent was at the time. That's part of the argument there. Um, you know, the contract covers, it gives Miramites all, Miramax rights in you know, all media now known or hereafter created, which clearly covers NFTs. But then there's this carve out for the, screen, the, the screenplay publication. Does this count as that or not? That's a big part of what they're fighting about. Um, so if I understand correctly, if Miramax was doing the NFTs, they would have complete legal ability to do that. Well, yes. no, I think I think well, depends on what the NFTs are, right? And so they car they carved up the rights. Okay, Miramax owns the film. There's no question about that. Miramax owns the and, and you know I don't think Tarantino is is arguing with with that. He's just saying, look, I reserve certain rights in the contract that were not granted to you. So if Miramax went out and did something that he thought were within the scope of his reserve rights, he could be the one suing. Uh, but it's it's just interesting. So my point is, and when you talk about the copyright law, the, the current Copyright Act is from 1976. So think about this. It includes a provision that an assignment or a license of a copyright can be terminated after 35 years. So you know you're the author of your of your paintings and your NFT, um, and you know you sell it out there. You could license it in theory. In, at the end of 35 years from now, and these things are perpetual, right? They're immutable. They're still gonna exist. They're gonna go up in value. Certain of these things, you know, the licenses, the rights, someone could decide, hey, I'm gonna terminate this. It's 35 years, I'm taking back the copyright. How does that work with an NFT that's on the blockchain? Right. Right. It's, so that, that's a, an interesting concept that people aren't really thinking about because this is moving so fast that 35 years seems like forever. Yeah. But going back to Quentin, it was, uh, what, it's almost 20 years ago, right? Like, in a few years, he, they have the right to just revoke Miramax's rights altogether. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. That's an interesting use case. Also, another use case that people are talking about right now are the crypto punks. People are doing derivative works, not just to own a crypto punk, but people are just taking somebody else's crypto punk and then selling it on OpenSea. Yeah, they're modifying it. Yeah, they're adding, you know, music to it, whatever they're doing um, to make it, sli you know, slightly theirs, but not theirs. Um, and they're getting away with it. Why is that? Well, I think, like, part of it is, like, the whole blockchain can be anonymous. And there's a lot, a lot of people that I think are doing, like, those derivative-type projects and kind of ripping off other people's IP. It's like whack-a-mole. Like, you get one shut down and three more are going to pop up. So it's really hard to enforce. It's and and I think it goes back to some of the concepts we've been we've been discussing. Um, the, I I, have, I looked at this recently, right? We talked about this at dinner the other night. So I, you know, I've looked at it. The crypto punks looked at their website. It doesn't really say anything about this at all. If you dig a little further, you look around. Apparently, there was some post on crypto punks Discord at some point, which presumably was after the fact for some buyers where they said, okay, we're adopting the NFT license that was written up by Dapper Labs. And that license says that NFT owners, they own the NFT, um, but they don't own the underlying art. You can, and then they license it to you for all any kind of personal use you wanna do. And from a commercial perspective, they allow you to use the NFT on merchandise up to $100,000 a year. So it's a very narrow slice of commercial rights. They are, according to that, reserving the rest of the rights to them. But it's not on their website. It doesn't appear to be in their sale documents like we just talked about in the description of it. They've adopted, they've purportedly adopted it in their Discord. Um, now they've also, recently there was news within the last few weeks that CryptoPunks signed with UTA, United Talent Agency, to be their agency to start licensing CryptoPunks. So there's an interesting Question. They seem to think they own the rights that they can license it. So if their crypto punks owners are going out and trying to make commercial use of their of their own crypto punks, who actually has those rights? It's I, from what I've seen, it's not entirely clear. And one of the things from a legal perspective, I think there's going to be litigation that's going to help to clear some of this. Stuff. So there are situations though where like 
if I started CryptoPunks, or okay, we'll use Knights of DGen actually, my project. Uh, we give people commercial rights to be able to do whatever they want with it, but it's non exclusive. So I still can use every single night. Even if you bought it, I can use it for my promotional materials because I made the art and, you know, whatever, and part of the company. But like it, with that UTA situation, like it could be that both could be right. Like they could have, the punk owner could technically have like the legal ability to go make t shirts up to 100 grand, and UTA could have the rights to go make t shirts, right? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. My point is, it's not clear based on what's out there on the website or in the actual, you know, NFT descriptions themselves. It's not. It's not clear, and that's going to lead to confusion. And someone's going to end up doing something that the other side thinks is is more than they're allowed to do. Um, now, I've also noticed in the Discord, right, a lot of the CryptoPunks owners they seem to acknowledge that these limitations exist. That what I have, well. I've seen references to these limitations, right, by CryptoPunks owners, so they've obviously heard about it. I don't know whether it happened, it, it, whether the CryptoPunks is actually trying to enforce that or not. Again, if it was done after the fact, that's a legal question too. Can you, after someone buys something from you, right? After some, you, yeah, can you change the terms and impose new obligations on them? Maybe if your initial sale said you could do that, right? right? So if there's a lot of interesting questions that come up. And then the new thing with smart contract can have a smart contract on top of a smart contract on top of a smart contract and they update each other so you can build that into the uh, original contract and so you can kind of move things as you go so these are the things that artists need to be thinking about with their projects because the way things are moving you know is it you know there's there's dags too it's not just blockchain um, that can post and sell nfts uh, these side chains. And wait, wait, sorry, what, I don't know what that word was. It, it's a eclectic graph technology. It's sort of like, like a, a blockchain, like a blockchain but, different? but yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's different. I, if I had a graph, I could kind of explain it more. I'm not an expert or anything. Um, but yeah, so those are emerging too. So there's a lot of unknown technology coming out that we need to all think about. And so that's why it's good if you're an artist to talk to a lawyer. And talk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and get your lawyer to talk to the, the engineers as well for the, the generative part. So, I mean, I, I think it depends. Like everybody that I recommend that get in the space and get their feet wet, I'm just saying like use the OpenSea contract for now. Like obviously, as as I get bigger, the smart contract. Yes, yeah. the smart contract. And like I don't think, I don't know. It just depends on where the artist is at, right? In their phase. Like our, our lawyers are expensive. Good ones are really expensive. And oh, right. right, yeah, right, that's true. Okay, but so, like, I don't want to go write a contract if I'm doing my first NFT, right? I'm not going to get some custom contract where I have to spend thousands of dollars to have it written, totally. Yeah, but if you are going to do something like crypto pumps or generative, so absolutely, RPs, please do, you do custom. yeah. And if you know, if you need financing, there's a lot of investors like Hugo who want to invest in your project before minting. Um, I have to end the panel now, but it was so great to be with you guys. I love this event. It's so chill. Um, and thank you. Congratulations to our panelists. Thank you, everyone.